Dr. Bloom is a co-founder of Boomicide. Possessing a deep background in electrobiology. biology, she spent 15 years using her technical expertise and product development knowledge to commercialize Humicide's biotechnology platform and bioengineered products. Today, Dr. Bloom will tell you about how biotechnology and engineering intersect in the field of medical products and her story of migrating from academia to the private sector. Please welcome Dr. Bloom. something out there that hasn't been done before. And so 
know, my, my, uh, my graduate work was very similar to that in gene therapy. Um, I thought that was going to be the new um, medical technology that changed the world, and all, everything was going to gene therapy. We were going to cure every type of ailment and every type of disease through gene therapy. And about a year and a half into my graduate work, a year and a half into my thesis, um, a young man up on the East Coast passed away um, who was in a gene therapy clinical study. And the government, rightfully so, making sure that we were doing this in a safe manner, shut all of the programs down that were working on gene therapy and pulled out all of the grant work that was supporting gene therapy. And so I had a decision to make. Do I continue to work on this and hope that one day we'll realize what a uh, potential gene therapy has, or do I jump ship and try something new? And, and I decided, you know, much like Joe, I had to get in and get out fast. I wasn't going to be a life or a graduate school. I didn't spend five to seven years. I wanted to kind of move forward. And so I stuck with it because I was a year and a half into the project and I did not want to start over. Um, I had some animal studies already up and running, and those are a pain, as many of you probably know, to start over. And so I pushed through and I continued. Um, I finished my PhD work in, in 2003 and came out here to Duke University to do a postdoc. And that was an interesting transition as well because I finished up my graduate work knowing that I did not want to be a professor. I wanted to be at the cutting edge of science and doing things that would eventually translate into helping and um, giving back to those patients in need. So kind of as I had looked into graduate school, which was let me find the coolest, most innovative program and, and work that I could, I approached my postdoc in somewhat a similar manner, which was if I'm going to go in and do a postdoc, which is kind of when I was in graduate school, that's what you were told to do, was you finished your graduate work, you got your PhD, you went into a postdoc and figured it out from there. Um, I was going to do the coolest postdoc I could find. And so that path led me here actually to Duke University, to a biomedical engineering lab of Laura Nicholson, where we came up with, and she had already brought me, the technology to grow vessels in a laboratory setting. So I wanted to kind of transition now from where I had been that got me here to talk a little bit more about Humicide, because Humicide was really born and bred from technology that is here within Duke, and kind of walk through where we started and where we're at now, and how my passion for wanting to develop my career and be able to give back to patients has really kind of infiltrated itself into every step of Humicide. So Humicide is a traditional, what you would call, regenerative medicine company. And I know that that term is thrown out a lot these days, kind of the, the sexy word in, in the media. The FDA is picking it up now. Um, entrepreneurs and new up and coming companies think about what can we be as a regenerative medicine company? How can we be in a regenerative medicine application? And really what regenerative medicine is, is taking something, putting it into the body to either fix or replace what's broken, and have it regenerate and become part of cells. It's much different than if it's a device of a plastic or metal composition which you put into the body. Sure, it fixes your knee, it fixes your hip, but it never becomes part of your cell. And where regenerative medicine is different in that aspect is you provide a solution, you provide a tissue, you provide a medical application through cells or some other type of um, protein therapy that actually causes the body to heal itself or replace what was broken and become part of cells. So Humicide focused on can we grow a blood vessel that is easy to use in the clinic, that's off the shelf just like a plastic or synthetic uh, device would be off the shelf, but is biologic in nature and becomes a part of the body. And that technology, um, Laura Nicholson started uh, several, like almost 25 years ago now back at MIT when she was a postdoc. Um, at the same amount of time that she was doing her residency from an idea that stems from a patient who could not have a coronary bypass surgery. Um, Laura was a surgical ICU uh, doc. She would oftentimes round in the morning and then one particular morning there was a patient who had been taken in the night before for coronary bypass grafting to repair clotted arteries on their heart. The team opened up that patient and unfortunately, if you have cardiovascular disease, it doesn't just target your heart. It typically targets all of the veins and the arteries in your body. So this particular patient had no option in, in itself to have veins harvested to use for this bypass. And so the team pretty much closed that patient up, sent them to recovery, and said, eh, we stented you. We can't do anything else. And at that point, Laura said, there has to be a way to provide patients who need medical therapy or 
who need help with a solution. Because telling them we can't do this is not an answer. And that's where the technology of can we grow a vessel in a laboratory that can be used in a clinical application came from. And there was many years that it was worked on at MIT, many years that it was worked on at Duke. And at the end of the period that we were here at Duke is when myself, Laura, and Shannon kind of came together and started Humusite. Is when we spun the company out and really began to push this technology forward. Um, kind of as Joe had, had spoken about, there is a need to research and to do science in a laboratory in an academic setting, and that kind of changes when you move out into industry, right? Because you have so many other drivers that are pulling at you. It's not only is the science sound, can you prove the technology, but can you get it through the FDA? Can you influence others who may be used to a plastic or synthetic raft as, as, as a vessel uh, solution to use a product that's new and different? Can you get the um, reimbursement with, with uh, the insurance company to buy into what you're, what you're trying to sell and how you're trying to change things? So you really have to look wholly at, at how you do things differently in a, in a business or an industry setting. And so, you know, we've spent the better path Past, uh, past 13 years trying to get this technology into play. So let me tell you a little bit about how we actually grow these vessels. It starts with the gift of donation. So on somebody's worst day, when they lose a loved one, we are able to take a piece of their tissue, remove cells from that tissue, and use those cells in our, tech oops, sorry, in our technology to grow hundreds of thousands of vessels from that one piece of donated tissue. So even here early on in the beginning of our in the beginning of our process or the beginning of our technology, I was able to find a, a touch point with where I really wanted to be able to say I've had an impact in my career. We can go to these recovery groups, these organ recovery groups that take these tissues from, from donors who have passed on, and we make a difference to their family because we can go back to them and say, we used your loved one's tissue to grow a hundred or thousands or ten thousands of vessels that are now going to help the lives of someone else. So this was very important to me to have a purpose that, that touched me in, in, in the point that it was giving back. It wasn't purely driven by financial outcome or notoriety. It was how do we make lives different from, uh, for, for those that are touched by the hemocyte uh, product. And so, as I said, it starts with a gift of donation. We, we receive tissue, those tissues are isolated in, in a typical laboratory setting that is, is under compliance for manufacturing um, practices, and at the end we recover vascular cells. Those vascular cells are seated onto a mesh where they readily attach. This mesh is in a, a tubular, a, a long tubular uh, structure, much like a vessel. If you kind of see there's a, a white uh, tube that runs the length of this plastic bioreactor bag. That white tube is initially our scaffold, where the cells are seated onto. Those cells grow into a tissue over a period of about eight weeks. At the end of those eight weeks, we now have a new vessel that has the identity of the donor we took those cells from. So that's not going to really work if we want to implant that tissue into any other person except that donor that's unfortunately no longer with us. So we had to come up with a technology that would allow us to take away the donor identity but not compromise the mechanical integrity and the structure and the ability of this new tissue to become part of someone else's body. So we came up with a decellularization process that actually removed all of the cells from that growing tissue and with it all of the donor's identity. So what we have left at the end is a brand new vessel that has no identity, it's completely bioquiet, can be implanted into any one patient who needs it and remodels itself to become part of that patient no longer has the original donor's identity to it. And so we spent about the better half, part of about eight or nine years proving that the technology works. And part of that was proving myself, proving to Laura, proving to Shannon, the founders, that it would work. It was proving to our scientists, it was proving to our preclinical surgeons who were implanting these into, into, uh, into animal models. And it was proving it to the FDA which is not an easy feat. And so after about 10 years of development within Humicide, we were able to do our first implant in Europe. This was roughly 20 years after Laura had the first idea to grow a blood vessel in a laboratory. So 
this kind of goes back to it's not something that happens quickly and it takes a lot of perseverance to put something forward that's never been done before because you're going to be hit and pushed down and told you can't do it time and time and time again. And so I can uh, excitedly say we have actually over 80 patients to date who have our muscles in uh, as implants. Uh, the majority of those are at the dialysis access uh, opportunity. And for those of you who may understand or, or have a loved one who's on dialysis, it is a very, very sad therapy to have to be on. Patients go into the dialysis clinics three times a week. They are punctured with uh, two separate needles each time, and it takes anywhere from four to six hours to do the complete dialysation. We've had some, some very good experience to date where our vessels, once implanted into the patient, remodel and become part of the patient. The flow is so good through our vessels during dialysis, we've actually given patients back a half hour to an hour of time each session, which for me, directly impacts the quality of life of those patients we're developing a new product for. To tell somebody you get three hours back a week is huge. The other thing we've been able to do is to provide a biologic product that becomes part of that patient that doesn't have the complications of some of the synthetic products out there. So these patients have a better overall quality of life because they have less uh, need to go back for revisions or replacements of the plastic uh, synthetic grafts. They have less uh, infection rates in our overall healthier patient population. I will point out that, uh, I don't know if, if, if any of you know, but the first implant here in the U.S. was at Duke University in, in uh, June of, of two, uh, 2013. And we actually have uh, a YouTube video that Duke helped us put together if you want to go and, and, and look at that. It's a pretty, a pretty cool video with uh, a man who really stepped forward and said, I'm doing this, not because I'm going to live forever, but I'm doing this to show what an application of a new technology can do to those patients coming up um, after me. And so <clears throat> one of the things I said early on was it's very important to ensure that a biologic regenerative medicine product remodels. Um, and we have some new data now showing that our tissue um, that is decellularized prior to implant actually becomes cellularized once implanted into the patient and becomes part of that patient's body with their own cells. The other interesting um, and really critical aspect of our product is that it heals. And what I was telling you earlier is that during dialysis patients, um, conduits are punctured with needles two times a week, uh, uh, dialysis time, three times a week. And for a synthetic or plastic graft, those punctures never heal. And so this is the reason why these fail all the time. But with Humicide's product, the cells that have grown into it actually remodel that matrix and heal it time and time again. So we, the humicide vessel will actually outlive the patient because it becomes part of the patient's own tissue. I put this slide in because it, it really hits home to why I do what I do every day. We had a young woman in Poland who was a little over 30 years old. She had lost her first kidney transplant and was back on dialysis. She had, has roughly had eight different dialysis access sites in her uh, arms and her uh, legs to dialyze to keep her alive. Um, and she was becoming increasingly sick, not being able to be dialyzed appropriately, was suicidal and, and very depressed, as you can imagine, over this, and was not healthy enough to get a second transplant. They convinced her to try the humicide graft. She had it implanted, and after about eight weeks of dialysis, was able to have her second round of kidneys. Um, she's now married and happily living in Poland. Um, and, and for me, this goes back to, I needed a touch point for why I went through undergrad, graduate school, postdoc, and what I was going to do with my career that gave back to people. I wanted that touch point of knowing that what I did on a day-to-day -day basis impacted people's lives, and this is just one example. And so just to touch back a little bit on, on, on the progress that we've made to date and the struggle that it's been over the past 13 years to get where we are, here's a snapshot of what it takes to get a biologic product through the FDA. It's typically anywhere from 15 to 20 years. And at this dashed line, this inflection point, we're about 13 and a half years in. So we have about three and a half years to go before we can get this product onto the market. And what it's taken is the group of us founders, as well as a very lean and mean team, to push this through when everybody told us we couldn't. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for uh, allowing me the time to kind of talk through. Um, in, in summary, I just want to say, no matter what your career path is now, Embrace change. 
embrace crazy, and go with what your gut says you want to do. Because what you want to do today is probably not what you wanted to do at five years old. It won't be what you want to do at 30 and 40 and 50 either. So.